Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Ghost. Amen. Come, Holy Ghost, fill the hearts of thy faithful, and kindle them without the fire of thy love. Send forth thy spirit, and they shall be created, and thou shalt renew the face of the earth. Let us pray, O God, who didst instruct the hearts of thy faithful by the light of the Holy Ghost. Grant us by that same spirit to be truly wise, and ever to rejoice in his consolation. Through Christ our Lord, amen. May the divine assistance remain always with us, and may the souls of the faithful depart with us. The mercy of God rest in peace. Amen. O Mary, seat of wisdom, pray for us. St. Joseph, pray for us. Our holy guardian angels, pray for us. Saints Peter and Paul, pray for us. All saints of God, pray for us. And let's pray for the souls of the faithful departed. Please remember Kathy Neighbor and uh, also Cheryl Krauss. Today is the anniversary of the death of, uh, of uh, Mary Eichler, also, so please remember her. Eternal rest grant unto them, O Lord, and let the perpetual light shine upon them. May they rest in peace. Amen. May their souls and the souls of all faith will depart into the mercy of God, rest in peace. Amen. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Ghost. Amen. Father, uh, Cheryl Krauss, was she from Cleveland or New York? Virginia. Oh. <laughs> okay. Did she, you said she came to the camps? Uh, she had children at the camp, but I don't know if she herself was there. That name sounds so familiar. Virginia. There are a couple of uh, questions here that came in. I guess just uh, just now. Uh, how to respond to Feeneyism? Uh, Feeneyism, uh, as you know, follows uh, the teaching of Father Leonard Feeney, a Jesuit, back in the 1930s and 40s, and finally excommunicated in the 1950s, early 60s. Um, Father Leonard Feeney was a theologian and uh, was uh, well known in the States. He was reacting to liberalism. The liberalism of the time was saying that uh, faith wasn't necessary, uh, baptism wasn't necessary to be saved. Uh, and Father Feeney responded to the, these errors by going to the opposite extreme. And there are those liberals at the time who were saying that uh, anyone who had any vague desire for baptism or even a vague desire to do what is right implicitly, uh, therefore desiring baptism without even knowing it, just a vague desire to do what was right, uh, that they were saved, they had baptism of desire, and uh, nothing more was necessary for them. Uh, Father Feeney went to the other extreme, and he said that there was no such thing as baptism of desire. Now, of course, we've seen this happen in, in the history of the Church uh, numerous times, where uh, one party will go to one extreme of an absolute denial, and... Uh, Another party will uh, respond by going to the exact opposite extreme. The problem is neither extreme, neither of the two extremes is correct. Both errors are errors against the faith. And uh, so the, the solution to uh, the problem of those who are so uh, completely misrepresenting the Church's teaching on the baptism of desire and baptism of blood is not to then do away with the doctrine and say there is no such thing as baptism of desire or baptism of God. The solution is to teach the true Catholic doctrine. And I'll give you an example uh, of this extremism. In the history of the Church, the Arian heresy, as you know, denied the divinity of Christ. And the Eutychians went to the other extreme of essentially denying the humanity of Christ. <clears throat> and so they went to the other extreme. Both of them were errors, both of them were condemned by the Church. So as I say, the solution to those who would misrepresent the Church's teaching of baptism, desire, and baptism of God, is not to deny the existence of these things, or the reality of these things, but to explain them correctly. And they haven't explained correctly. In fact, there was a father, uh, Father Joseph Fenton, who explained them very beautifully. Uh, he was one of the very conservative uh, theological experts of Vatican II, uh, an American. 
he wrote very forcefully as to what was going on in Vatican II, condemning it. Um, and um, he also wrote on the subject of baptism of desire and baptism, baptism of blood, and the doctrine that there is no salvation outside the church. So, uh, to answer this question, I would just leave it at this. Okay? To get into a big discussion about this, uh, Eugene the Fourth and all the rest of the things that the Viniads bring up and distort, because they don't have a comprehensive view, they, they approach Catholic tradition the way Protestants approach Scripture. They take certain elements of Catholic tradition as the Protestants take certain elements of sacred scripture. And they basically do not harmonize the words of sacred scripture with everything that is said there as though it is all revealed by God and therefore it's all true. They don't harmonize that. They will pick out one thing or another they will not even reconcile our Lord's words or apparent, or obviously merely apparent contradictions there. They will simply take something to support their extreme view, one-sided view, and they will present that as other with a doctrine of our Lord, and it is distorted. And uh, so it is with the Fenians. That's what they do. They, they mine sacred tradition, the doctrine, they, the Statements of councils and popes and so on that support their view, it seems to be absolutist view. There is no such thing as baptism, desire, baptism, blood. Um, but I would just answer them with one thing, that I wouldn't get into anything else with them. I would say Christ does not contradict himself, the church does not contradict herself. Uh, in the year 1566, the first year of the reign of Pope Pius V, St. Pius V, whose authority we would hope that they would accept as being a true Catholic pontiff. The first edition of the Catechism of the Council of Trent was issued under the authority of Pius V, under his name. And within that very first edition of the Catechism of the Council of Trent, and in every edition since then, the Church has stated uh, with absolute clarity that the church is, does not have the concern to baptize adult converts as immediately as she baptizes babies or infants. And the reason why, this is under the, by the way, under the topic of adult baptism in the Catechism of the Council of Jack. The reason why the church is not as concerned to uh, baptize them so quickly, but rather take time that adults learn their faith and show that they are serious about their conversion, is for this reason, that the dangers attending the death of a child did not attend the death of an adult, because the adult has the intention to convert, to repent of sins, to receive baptism. The, the words used by the Catechist of the Council of Trent are that if an adult does not receive the waters of baptism through no fault of his own, he intends to be baptized as a Catholic, but he dies and therefore is prevented from receiving the waters of baptism, that his true contrition for his sin and his intention to be baptized, now there's the desire, will avail him unto grace and justification. And now you're talking about the justification of the soul from sin, which is the first effect of baptism. And that grace we know as sanctifying grace. The waters of the baptism were not, baptism were not poured, the sacrament was not administered. Nonetheless, the Church says very clearly that it is the, the, the true contrition of the penitent, the true contrition of the catechumen for his sins, and his intention to be baptized to receive the sacrament will avail him, will suffice for this, grace and justification. That is what is necessary for salvation. If they wish to argue, the argument is not with us. The argument was with St. Pius V. All you have to do is show it to them. I have photocopies. If you want to show them the original Latin, 
It is not that difficult. One doesn't need a great deal of Latin background to be able to look at the English and see the correspondence of the Latin. The English translation so that I have seen, very, very good, very clear. Uh, the Latin is even clearer, as often happens, than the English. So, um, if they, whatever else they may quote, they're misunderstanding and misinterpreting. That statement, they cannot get around. They have to either acknowledge there's a contradiction in the church's teaching, which of course is part of their problem, which might be considered to be such a serious matter for them to deny this teaching of the church, or they have to uh, simply dismiss what you're saying as though it doesn't count. But they cannot say that these words, this teaching is not contained in the Catechism of the Council of Trent because it absolutely is contained in the Catechism of the Council of Trent. So um, anyway, that's, that's all I'll say about that. Now, if anyone has copies of that, I'd be glad to give you the copies. And uh, with regard to capital punishment, <clears throat> how to answer the accusation that we can't be pro-life if we support capital punishment? <clears throat> well, of course, this is all uh, part of uh, uh, Cardinal Barnadin's seamless garment um, deception that he foisted on the people um, way back in the 1980s, I guess it was. Uh, trying to, to uh, defuse and, and disorient the pro-life effort by saying, well, let's look at the whole pro-life effort. We must be against capital punishment and, and a variety of other things. Taking the focus off the innocence of the, of the child and uh, the damage that the, the abortion does to the child and the child, depriving the child of baptism. Um, Cardinal Cardinal simply ignored it said, well, let's look at the seamless garment, he called it. Light, light verbiage uh, is all it is. It's just very deceitful. Um, the pro-life people who were actually trying to save the lives of the innocent children from being aborted were terribly dismayed at this uh, manifest uh, tactic to derail the pro-life effort in the church by somehow tying it together with uh, being against capital punishment. In the eyes of, of the Catholic Church, though, in terms of her moral teaching, this is an abomination, this idea of equating the matter of capital punishment with aborting a, an unborn child. It is an abomination in the eyes of the Catholic Church's teaching because, first of all, the unborn child does not have the benefit of baptism. Nor could it have the benefit of a, a baptism of desire. And so um, the criminal, being a person who is capable of committing a crime, has the use of reason, has the possibility, even a baptism of desire, let alone the actual sacrament of baptism, at his beck and call, so to speak. And he can, be, he, he can repent of his sins. The innocent, the unborn child, innocent of any actual sin, nonetheless does carry the sin of nature, original sin of the soul, and is dependent upon that, that uh, sacrament of baptism. Um, so this was, again, one of, the, one of the early blows against the the not only the significance of the sacrament of baptism, but also against the very idea of guilt and innocence have anything to do with a person's right to life. <clears throat> a, uh, a person who is guilty unto mortal sin of having of a capital crime, of a crime deemed worthy by the society in which we live and the supreme authorities in the society which that is, our, our government officials, who is deemed worthy of death, <clears throat> sentenced to death because of a crime he's committed, has forfeited a right that he has. <clears throat> um, he has forfeited that right. He can be found guilty of a capital crime and can be executed. The church has always taught this doctrine. The idea of 
that the killing of a, of a criminal, <coughs> and in our society, someone who's guilty of an especially heinous crime, and equating that with the aborting of a baby, again, it nullifies the, the essential difference between innocence and guilt. And we have this following again, the political idea of the modern times to not only um, favor the quote-unquote rights of the guilty, but to lionize them as though they are victims of the society in which they live. To absolve them of all personal responsibility and to blame everyone else, including you and me, for the fact that this individual has committed the horrible crimes that he has. And uh, the unborn baby, on the other hand, is vilified as an enemy because he's an intruder in the womb and he's threatening to destroy the life of the woman who has invited him in, often by committing very serious crimes of impurity. But that doesn't count, because he's the villain because he's threatening her, excuse the expression, sex life. And that's the worst crime you can commit these days. You go down to an abortion clinic and try to tell the woman that the life she's carrying is a human life, and she will look at you with hatred, and her boyfriend will will threaten to beat you up. Why? Because you were a threat to what? Yes, they're right. Their activity together. That's the worst possible thing you can do, is try, is get between them and the notion that their sexual activity is all about them and has nothing to do with giving life, it's just about their personal enjoyment of life. Uh, but this is the modern mentality, and it's devilish. It's really devilish. And so this, this idea of the seamless garment uh, erasing the lines totally between innocence and guilt and turning the tables, making the innocent guilty and the guilty innocent, is simply putting into play what was condemned in the Old Testament, woe to those who call evil good and good evil. And this will carry a, a very special judgment of God against it. So um, with regard to uh, equating Abortion with capital punishment. There, again, books can be written about it, but tonight we don't have to write a book. Uh, it is a very evil thing because it's based on a total distortion and a denial of Catholic doctrine. Uh, now, I've been asked repeatedly to address a certain question that I really didn't want to talk about. I'll tell you, that's why I've been asked repeatedly about this. And because I figured, well, I don't want to talk about it, and you don't want to hear it. So, right? What are you talking about? Um, I don't have it, so you don't need it. Well, <laughs> isn't that a commercial somewhere? That we can yeah, something like that. <laughs> but uh, but uh, over the course of time, there have been repeated, repeated requests to talk about this. And um, Despite my reluctance, I've come to see that it's actually something rather relevant. It's relevant to something that's happening right now in the traditional Catholic effort. I don't call it a movement, I call it effort. Okay, the traditional Catholic effort here. It is relevant to what's happening now. First of all, our young adult Catholics, traditional Catholics, don't know. They just really don't know about this. And they're the ones who are asking. And the older generation, when I say older, I mean those that are for about 45, 55, like the rest of us. Um, most of those older generation know something. Some of them think they know everything there is to know about this, but I tell them, not only don't they know, but they've got many misconceptions about it. So they think they know, but they really don't know. And what they think they know is often wrong. <laughs> and uh, another reason why I decided to go to talk about it is because it helps to understand what's happening in the uh, Society of St. Pius X right now. And another reason why I thought, well, okay, well, I'll give in and talk about it, is because the problem can't be remedied unless we actually understand it 
and uh, understand it thoroughly, understand it correctly, and that is really uh, whatever hope there is to remedy the problem. How serious is the problem? Well, you know, you've talked to me, you've told me about this. The divisions among traditional Catholics is a very, very big problem. It's a burning problem. It affects every single one of us. Personally, priests and laity are suffering from this terrible. Your families divided among chapels, right? This is an awful thing. And so, if we were to trace the line of this division after division back, we'd come to one major crisis, which really was a crisis for so many traditional Catholic families in this country. And it goes all the way back to the early 1980s, for most of you, but it goes be back beyond that into the 1970s for the priests. And that is, how did the Society of St. Pius V come to be? How did it come to be that there were priests, and you know, including myself, who were expelled from the Society of St. Pius V? How did that happen? What actually took place there? Uh, now, in trying to tell you what I know, I have to warn you, there are a lot of things I don't know. But I know I don't know. I wasn't involved uh, personally in many conversations that took place there. So all I can do is tell you what I do know. But what I do know at least at least to start. Okay. One thing that I will tell you I know that many think people think is true, but I know it's false. I know it's not true. The common misconception that people have seems to be this that the whole issue revolved around sedivicantism. That the priests who uh, are associated with Father Dolan, Father Chicada, Father Sanborn, so on, that the issue was their city of the countess, we're all city of the countess, that's why the Archbishop had to expel us. I tell you, that had nothing to do with this. Nothing to do with this. Why do I tell you this? Because I know it's true. <clears throat> in 1976, when I arrived in Acon, <coughs> One of the first writings that I encountered in French was Monsieur Lefebvre's work, Le Coup de Maître de Satan, L'Obéillance, the master stroke of Satan, excuse my poor French pronunciation, but the master stroke of Satan, obedience. And in that work, Monsieur Lefebvre himself said, there are those who say that Paul VI is not a true pope. Perhaps they are correct. That's what he said. Perhaps they're right. The church in the future will have to decide this question. It seemed fair to me. At that time, I was more in favor of regarding John the Twenty-Third and Paul the Six as popes without question. I wouldn't even argue about that. But those who were taking the state of Acontis side, and to this day, I still have. Very severe misgivings about the dogmatic state of Acontis position, which I've already explained to you a bit. In fact, recently I uh, got into a little verbal exchange with some dear soul on the very question, as you might recall. But anyway, um, but let's leave that behind. The Archbishop did make that statement in writing in 1976 in this work that you can still obtain and in English translation, not just in the original French. You can read it for yourself. Now, I also know this, and I know this because I've been told this by Bishop Kelly and some of the other priests who were priests. Bishop Kelly was simply a priest when this happened back in the early 1980s. I was not involved in this, but Bishop uh, Monsieur Lefebvre came to visit the priest in Oyster Bay Cove, and he had been receiving complaints from the United States probably more from Missouri area, but around, around the missions also, receiving complaints that Father Dolan was making <coughs> provocative statements, uh, I guess some would say incendiary statements, about the popes, about Paul VI, John, Paul, John XXIII, and so on, and was making very definite statements about how they were not popes, and making mocking statements about them and so on. This word was received, re, 
landing in <coughs> Switzerland in the mail of Archbishop Lefebvre as people were complaining to him. So Archbishop Lefebvre came to Oyster Bay Cove and he met with uh, Father Kelly, uh, Father Dolan, they called Chicada, and uh, possibly Father Sanborn. I think Father Sanborn was involved there, I could be wrong, but I think he was. And uh, Monsignor Fett actually had a prepared statement that he wanted those priests to sign. He wanted them to sign on the dotted line that they acknowledged the papacy of, John, of Paul VI. That they acknowledged Paul VI to be a true pope. Now, to my knowledge, the only one of the priests who was making very bold statements about against the papacy of Paul VI was Father Dolan. I had not heard Bishop Kelly, or Father Kelly at the time, make such statements, and I had not heard Father Sanborn make such statements. But Father Dolan was very uncertain about it. But even though uh, the other priests might not have been quite so, uh, what should I say, well, incendiary on the subject, they did have their doubts. They were not willing to sign that they were convinced that <coughs> Paul VI was a true pope. And so they couldn't sign the document. What they wanted to do was propose to Monsignor Lefebvre that he, he at least uh, allowed them to sign a document that they did not um, dogmatically deny that he was a true pope. That's my understanding. Uh, but Monsignor Lefebvre was pretty much holding his ground on that. He wanted them to sign the statement as it was. And um, at that time, Monsieur Lefebvre told them that they would have to leave because they refused to sign. Well, that very night, there was, I think, mass, at least benediction, devotions. The people in Oyster Bay were told that Monsieur Lefebvre was going to be there. They came streaming in. They, were, they not only had uh, the devotions in the chapel, led by Monsieur Lefebvre, but they actually had a great reception for him afterwards at Oyster Bay, not even knowing that the, all the priests there had just been expelled. A rather awkward situation, to say the least. Right? Well, Monsieur Lefebvre had been led to believe that the priests had been stirring up the people against him and against the Society of St. Pius X. And it, it's so ironic that after having had this conversation, presenting the document, the priest saying, we can't sign this, Monsieur Lefebvre telling the priest they had to leave the society, and then all of these people, how many, hundreds, probably, yes, no doubt hundreds, came, and they were all so happy to see Monsieur Lefebvre. They made him feel so welcome. They thanked him so, so uh, gen genuinely for his staunch defense of the faith, uh, Monsignor Lefebvre went to bed that night um, with a kind of um, paradox in his mind that he'd been hearing all of these things about how the priests were there, were stirring up trouble in the SSPX and uh, stirring up people in the state of ecotism and turning them against him. And then he had this experience where all of the people come out and they're just so thrilled to see him and so grateful to him. The next morning when Archbishop de Pep got up, he came down to breakfast and he told the priest, what I said last night, that's all right, don't worry about it. He just said they didn't have to leave. So they didn't, he didn't say any more about it. He said it was just like that. So, curious. And, uh, but I know also personally that it was not about Sadie Vincontism because uh, in 1982 when Monsieur Lefebvre came to the States, and um, he came to impose the John the Twenty Third changes in the bereavement. Now that affects us. That doesn't affect you so much, but it affects the priest every single day of his life because every day, under pain of mortal sin, we have we are bound to go and to pray in the divine office for an hour and a half, two hours every day, depending on how quickly you can say the office. It's not a contest, it shouldn't be. Uh, how quickly you can pray the office, I should say. But, uh, so you see how changes in that, the John the 23rd changes, which would seem now relatively minor, uh, actually did affect each one of us. In Europe, they were using, the, the SSPX was using the John the 23rd changes and had been for quite some time. Remember, the Society of St. Pius X was established in 1970. 
And so, uh, in 1982, we, in the United States of America, were still using the uh, text of the, of the briefery, the divine office we prayed every day, without the John the 23rd changes, the pre-John the 23rd changes, as we were offering the Mass, following the Missal, as it was before the John the 23rd changes of 1960 and 1962 and 1963 and so on. Well, he died by 1963. Um, so in the States here, and actually in England too, there was uh, kind of a, an understanding that in the English-speaking world, we did not use the John of the 23rd changes. I understood that at a general council of the society, it was even explicitly stated that in the English-speaking world, the priests would use the pre-John the 23rd divine office and mass. That was my understanding when I, when I came, when I was ordained and the understanding of the others as well, as I'll see you, because that had a very important role to play in what developed, finally. This understanding that in the English-speaking world we didn't use the John of the changes. Um, state of Accountism. Again, Archbishop of Feb came to the seminary, now in Ridgefield, and was calling the priests in. He called me in. We, I met with him there. And he's very gracious, and uh, we spoke French, and, uh, well, he spoke French, I spoke something. Uh, but um, the conversation was in, in French. And at one point, Monsieur Le Pen asked me point blank, do you uh, use, uh, let's see, that would have been uh, John, the, John Paul II's name in the canon of the Mass, as you know following the Mass and your Missiles. Before the priest comes to the consecration, he says that he is offering the Mass in union with uh, the Pope, with the bishops, the bishop of the diocese in particular, and all true teachers of the Holy Catholic faith. And so only in times of uh, St. Evacontism, when there is no living Pope, do you, does one omit the name? And that's what you're supposed to do. When the Pope has died and another Pope is not elected, you simply do not say the name, because there is no name to say it. Uh, so I informed Monsieur Lefebvre that in fact I did not, but I just uh, said the prayer without the name of uh, John Paul II or uh, the Bishop of the Diocese there, and he uh, asked me, why would I do that? And I explained to him that uh, for me it was a matter of simple honesty that I, I was about to consecrate our blessed Lord in the Holy Eucharist, to take the host in my hand, pronounce the words of consecration, be facing Christ in the Blessed Sacrament, and consecrating the chalice and be, be looking into the chalice as I'm saying the words and, and looking into the blood of Christ there. And then adoring the, the body and blood of Christ as, uh, before I elevate for you to make an act of adoration. <clears throat> and here I am being required to say something that I am not convinced is true. I'm required to say that I am one in faith, una cum, is the expression, una, cum. The sense of that, understood by all the liturgists and the, all of those who explain the meaning of the Mass, is all the same, that I am saying I am one in faith with John Paul II. And that I am one in faith with the Bishop of, of Bridgeport, Connecticut. I didn't believe it. I was quite convinced I was not one in faith with the Bishop of Bridgeport, Connecticut. Uh, I had very little doubt about that. I had very serious doubts about the faith of John Paul II. And so I could not honestly say something there at that most solemn moment of my life, and every priest's life, that I was not convinced was true. And uh, I told him it wasn't really a matter of deciding whether he's a pope or not, I just don't really the issue of the faith, I don't know that we, he and I have the same faith. Because I know what faith he has, I, he have, I have. I'm just not sure what faith he has. So, 
Monsignor Lefebvre, at that point, simply looked at me for a few for a few seconds, nodded his head, and dropped the subject. And it was the last he ever raised the subject. He just let it go. And he knew from that moment on that I did not use John and Paul II's name in the Catholic Mass. He never brought it up to me again. St. of Conscience, it was not the issue. He knew the other priests were using John Paul II's name in the Catholic Mass. It wasn't the issue. So what became the issue? Well, uh, this, is, this is what became the issue, and we weren't even aware it was happening. Let me tell you, we weren't aware why it was happening, um, that there was trouble. And so, uh, in the early 1980s, uh, Monsignor Feb began to impose certain changes on the priests here in the States, meaning myself and all the other priests. And he began requiring that we accept the changes to the John XXIII bravery, the divine office. <coughs> he said that he was imposing those changes because when the priests came to visit us from Europe, they felt uncomfortable because they had to adjust to the pre-John XXIII changes when they, when they came to pray the divine office in the church with us. And when we would go to Europe, that we would find an adjustment to use the John XXIII changes. And so to unify, homogenize uh, the Society of St. Pius X in Europe and the Society of St. Pius X in, in the States and in England, uh, he decided that it was necessary to impose these changes. Well, Yes, and actually this made a certain amount of sense. You know, we could see that, well, it did seem rather awkward, anyway, to have these two different sets of rubrics um, that were actually affected the prayers, the flow of the prayers that were on us. My thought, and I think the thought of the other priests was, well, shouldn't, if we're going to be going one way, shouldn't we be going back to the traditional way? Why would we make John the 23rd the standard? Because if John the 23rd changes, we're all steps toward the Novus Ordo. So why would we, who weren't using those changes, take a rather large step toward the Novus Ordo? That didn't make sense to us. Um, but one of the other concerns, and this is a concern that I raised to Archbishop of Feb when he and I had the conversation, as I mentioned, uh, the concession, uh, the conversation about uh, Unacum, I mentioned to Monsieur Lefebvre if, that if the changes to the bravery, uh, the changes of 1962 or of John the 23rd were adopted, that it would be necessary also to impose the changes in the Mass. Because the prayers of the Divine Office and the prayers of the Mass are all one. They go hand in hand. You just can't have that dichotomy between the two. It doesn't make sense. But Monsignor Lefebvre told me at the time that this would affect only the divine office. It would not affect the mass. But I, I, I always considered up Monsignor Lefebvre an honest man, and I still do. But, and maybe at that time, he really didn't intend to impose the changes in the mass. But the fact is that a year later, he came to the States, and he did impose those changes in the mass to the John XXIII changes. And Father Sanborn, who was the director of the seminary at the time, accepted them. And a number of the other priests at the seminary accepted the changes of God right there. I did not. And that had some uh, consequences for me. Uh, um, Monsieur Lefebvre said that at the seminary, we had, to, with the masses at the seminary, had to be said according to the John the 23rd rubrics. But the masses in the missions did not have to accept the John of the 23rd Rubens. The, the result of that for me was that I was not offering any masses at the seminary. That every Sunday I would be traveling to the missions. The way we had it worked out, the priests would, every month or so, get one Sunday they could stay back and relax. And that didn't happen. 
Uh, and I'd also get up early in the morning and offer a 5, 5.30 Mass uh, according to the non John XXIII rubrics. And even in the bravery, it was um, awkward to keep bumping into these changes here and there. Uh, so, in any case, um, uh, that's how we're going to do it for a short time. And things seemed to be getting along. There was rumbling at the seminary, rumbling and grumbling on both sides of the issue. And then uh, an event took place that uh, made it impossible to just uh, sort of let bygones or let this go. Uh, in November 2nd, 1982, uh, three priests were ordained. Uh, Monsignor Lefebvre ordained Father Hunter, Father Skierke, and Father Zapp. We just uh, passed their 31st anniversary. Father Martin Skierke, many of you know, in Montana, he just celebrated his 31st anniversary of the ordination. And on uh, the day that he was uh, ordained, the day after All Souls Day that year, um, Everything seemed to be seemed to be fine. We didn't see enormous storm clouds on the horizon. We were rather naive with that, though, because um, the next question came up as to where to assign the three priests. And Monsieur Lefebvre uh, was the one making the assignments. Now, by that time, the Society of Saint Pius X had already split into two districts. Originally, it was just the United States district, and then there was the Northeast District and the Southwest District. Uh, Father Kelly was in charge of the Northeast District, and Father Baldick was in charge of the Southwest District, and St. Mary's in Kansas was in Father Baldick's Southwest District. Father Zapp was assigned, the newly ordained Father Zapp was assigned to go to St. Mary's in Father Baldick's district, where the John the 23rd changes in the bravery and the mass were being used. Now, Father Zapp had never uh, really encountered the John XXIII. He always understood he would not be expected to accept these changes. Uh, he had learned to offer Mass without those changes, and he was very reluctant to go and use those changes. And so he made it very, he made it clear to Monsignor Lefebvre that he felt very uncomfortable doing that. Um, and so he asked for permission to go to St. Mary's, but to offer private Masses, as I had done. Often, Father Zapp was serving my Mass at 5, 5.30 in the morning, actually. <clears throat> so, he perhaps thought that he could do the same at St. Mary's. That was absolutely refused. He had to accept the John XXIII changes. That was actually the, the point that precipitated the unraveling of the whole situation. That question of Father Zapp being required to go to St. Mary's and to offer Mass using the John XXIII changes or be expelled from the society. That was the choice that Monsieur Lefebvre gave him. Monsieur Lefebvre made it very clear, if you do not do that, accept this assignment and say the John XXIII uh, changes in the Mass, you will be expelled from the society. Now remember, he had just ordained you months before. <coughs> that was that was something to the rest of us absolutely intolerable. That became the issue for us. As I say, Brother Sanford had already accepted the job for energy changes. He was using them openly. So were a number of the other ones. The issue for us became this matter of threatening to expel a priest whom you just ordained better a month before over this. Because you can't do that. And the Catholic Church doesn't conduct itself. Uh, the Church actually says there's a bilateral relationship, a mutual relationship between one ordained and the one who ordains it. There's a responsibility there. Um, the Church might excommunicate someone and expel them but uh, that is only the last resort. Even for a horrible sinner, public sinner, 
the church tries to get the individual at least to live in one of the houses, go to a monastery somewhere, live a private life, no matter how terrible the crime is he committed. But they don't just throw him out on the street and say, well, get lost. We, never, we don't know you. <laughs> but this was a pattern we had seen, and I had seen, and I know the others had seen it, in the society uh, all along, that we, we had seen uh, priests simply told to get up. And, um, in fact, um, the, the coming and going of the societies and bias, the tenth as to who was coming and who was going, uh, was, in my mind, rather scandalous. Uh, because it seemed like there was no real rule governing this. Now, you might think that's a criticism from Monsignor Lefebvre. Um, and I guess some might take it that way. I don't see it that way. I don't see it that way for this reason. Because I believe Monsignor Lefebvre was doing the very best he could do under the circumstances. He was in an extremely difficult situation, especially considering his own training. He was trained in the Vatican Diplomatic Corps. He was trained in diplomacy. He was trained in trying to find solutions. He was not trained in confrontation. He was trying, trained in avoiding confrontation. But here he was, the lone bishop, essentially the lone bishop standing up against the moderates. And there was confrontation. And uh, now people have sometimes voiced to me, wonderment, that there was only one bishop who courageously stood up and spoke out so that the whole world could hear him. There were other bishops who would perhaps whimper here or whimper there. But he was alone for a long time, standing up and speaking boldly and forthrightly, and people are, I hear them say, why, there was only one bishop? That's, in, that's incredible. But for me, actually, it's the opposite. I'm amazed that there was one bishop, even one bishop who would do that. I'm amazed that after all of the preparations they made, the careful selections they made of bishops, to be sure that every one of them could be cowed into at least silence, if not cooperation with the changes. That they would all be organization men first and Catholic second. That there was one. I'm amazed there was one bishop. I think that is a tremendous stroke of God's grace. That any one of them had the courage to stand up. There were bishops who stood up with Bishop Lebeth and Vatican II. But after Vatican II and the new mass came out, after those documents were signed, sealed, delivered, Every single one of those who stood with him in Vatican II caved in. None of them would be seen to stand with him publicly. Not a single one. All of the Cetus, Cetus Internationalis Patro, that band of traditional bishops, archbishops, he was the only one. So, uh, I consider that to be a great thing. Uh, I still have a great love for Archbishop of Feb. I still have his picture hanging uh, in my, outside my door in the rectory there. And still offer Mass for him uh, on the occasion of his birthday and the occasion of the day of his death. Uh, and always will, as long as I can. So, I consider him to be a great hero of the faith. Um, the fact that he did not start the society of St. Pius X, the full-blown set of constitutions that he had created, doesn't surprise me. The fact that I arrived in Canada in 1976, six years after the society was established, and eventually found out by accident that there was actually a constitution, so to speak, for the society, asked for a copy. Uh, one of the priests, Father Lagerschlager, had a copy he let me borrow. It consisted of pipe mimeographed pages. That's it. Not really constitutions or statutes governing a religious congregation by any means. In retrospect, I should not have found that surprising at all, because this was these were battlefield conditions. And uh, I still think Monsieur Lefebvre was doing a, a, a marvelous thing, a wonderful thing. The miraculous thing in spite of all of that, with the bombs bursting in air and the rockets red flare all around him. 
Um, and the, especially the fact that his training was in the Vatican diplomatic corps. So, in any case, um, in, my, in my own case, for example, I was expelled from the Society of St. Pius X when I wasn't even a member. And you might ask, well, how could they expel me if I wasn't a member? And I would ask the same question. How did I come not to be a member? By attrition. My, my engagement ran out. It expired a year before I was, I was expired, before I was expelled. I had signed up for a year. When that one year engagement was over, I, I signed up for three years. When that three years was over, I was teaching at the seminary at Richfield. No one said a word. Your engagement is over. You need to renew. Would you want to renew? I had the choice of either renewing the engagement with the society or not. I could have simply walked away at that point. It's an engagement. I go in the periodic sort of like religious vows, but they weren't even vows. They were just basically an engagement. And so for about a year after my engagement expired, no one said anything to me, and I didn't say anything to anyone. I just figured, oh well, I'm here, I guess they're okay with that. You know, I have no intention of going anywhere, so maybe it doesn't really matter that much. And so uh, when it turned out that I was expelled later on, I thought, well, this is a peculiar way of doing things. You don't uh, require people to re-op, as it were, uh, renew their engagement, and, but you let them continue on as though it's, it doesn't matter one way or the other until you find it necessary to expel them. I was just very puzzled by the, by the way of, uh, of conducting this thing, but I, I really do believe that it comes down to this. I think Archbishop of Fab was dependent on, on a number of people, many of them young priests, young priests whom he had just ordained, a uh, matter of five, six, seven, eight years before. He was dependent upon them to actually conduct the affairs of the society, and they weren't really... They hadn't gone through that old seasoned seminary training that had been there for centuries. They just didn't have it. Um, the Archbishop was doing as well as he possibly could under the circumstances. And he had to rely on, on people like myself, actually, who had never had that real serious formal training at the seminary where everything was all mapped out, all extremely settled and solid and stable. We were trained under battlefield conditions. And uh, so what happened, what happened was this. After Father Zapp was threatened with expulsion, the priests of the northeast district in Oyster Bay, the priests of the seminary, Father Sanborn and myself, we got together, we met, and we all agreed that this is not any way to do things. To, uh, to ordain a priest one day and then threaten to expel him better once later. And certainly not over these changes. So, we got together and composed a letter to Monsieur Levin. In the first letter we sent, in the original draft contained six points. And we approved that six point letter and we sent it to Monsieur Levin. Uh, not to go through all the six points, but we objected to uh, not just the imposition of the John of 23rd changes, which we thought was heading in the wrong direction, but the threat to expel a newly ordained priest. Uh, we objected to priests being used by Father Baldick in the Southwest District. We didn't even know if they were ordained, let alone how they were ordained. They didn't have any documentation or proof of documentation. There were even uh, schismatic priests, old Catholics, who were taken in and being employed to offer Mass for the Catholic faithful in the Catholic chapels on Sunday Mass. These men, at least these two we know of, were so, so suspect that even the Novus Ero Diocese of Fresno would not have anything to do with them. So, so we, we knew that this was not a good thing. Um, but there were a number of other issues. Finally, there was added a seventh issue. And the seventh issue had to do with this, uh, the properties of the society. This became a problem later when people were latching onto this, as though 
they were after the properties of the site. But actually, that wasn't the case at all. The issue was this. The properties of the Society of St. Pius X, which were acquired largely through our own efforts and with our own promises and commitments to be there for Mass, the properties that were acquired uh, <coughs> using the donations and the generosity of the Catholic people in this country wanted to have the Catholic faith. These were owned by corporations. We set up the corporations. And we set up the corporations using the bylaws that were sent to us from Switzerland. And um, we incorporated in Delaware. Delaware is a big state for a corporation because it's so easy to do. It requires so little. But there were other corporations that were set up in some of the other states as well. And um, The trouble with the, those corporations was that the bylaws, the, even the articles of incorporation, nowhere said that the Novus Ordo Mise, the New Order of Mass, would never be said in those churches. Now at first, when we were doing the incorporating, we just took it for granted, well, of course, this is Society of Pius X, the Novus Ordo will never be said, we just understood that. But after what we saw going on in the Southwest District, we became aware that it was necessary to stipulate that in the Articles of Corporation. So we added the seventh point, and that was we wanted to stipulate, to amend the bylaws of the corporations to say that the Novus Oral Mass could never be said in any of these chapters. Now, what added a certain urgency to that was the fact that one of the priests had contacted Switzerland, contacted, I believe it was Father Denis Roque. Father Roque was the uh, economic general of the society, so he was the one who was kind of watching over the properties and the corporations and so on. Contacted him and asked him, before all of this broke, asked him to allow us to add to the bylaws, to amend the bylaws, to state that the Novus Order, the new mass, would never be said in these chapters. And we were told, you cannot change those. You must not have that. That, to us, was a red flag. So when the whole situation came to a head, uh, we added that seventh point, that because all of the chapels are owned by corporations, and the corporations are governed by individuals who kind of come and go, we want to make sure that the laws of the uh, the governing of the corporations pre prevent the Novus Ordo from being said in these chapters. No, they will not return for that purpose. So, with these seven points on the table, um, we waited for the response, and the response was that Monsignor Lefebvre was coming to the States to speak with us directly about these things. And when Monsignor Lefebvre came in April of 1983, he uh, he came prepared to settle these issues. Um, he came to the seminary, he fired Father Sanborn as rector. And this was, I thought, very peculiar because Father Sanborn, although he'd signed the letter, nonetheless had accepted the John XXIII changes to the Brewery, and accepted the John XXIII changes to the Mass, was using John Paul II's name in the canon of the Mass. He had done everything that the Archbishop had asked him to do all along. And yet he was the first one to be fired and expelled. Well, he, no, I can't say that. He was the first one to be fired, let's put it that way. He wasn't expelled at that time. And uh, <clears throat> Monsieur Lefebvre actually had talked to me a couple of days before that. And had talked to me about making me the district superior in England. He had talked to Father Sanborn about making him district superior in Ireland. I figured, well, if Father Sanborn gets Ireland, England. Not really. Uh, neither one of us wanted to be district superior anywhere, frankly. Um, but we began to realize that this was just an old, actually, church way of moving someone into position <laughs> out of where they are, where they're making trouble. Okay? So there's a certain validity to this tactic. It can work when it's really necessary. You know? It's necessary at times. Uh, but anyway, um, I need to say, I just thank Monsignor Lefebvre for his confidence, but I told him I really didn't think that I was capable of handling that. He, he just dropped it at that point. I don't think it was, 
But in any case, regardless. The, um, the, this, the seminary was a problem. Okay? So the seminary was fired. I was kind of in limbo at that point. Uh, the Monsignor Lefebvre then went down and talked to the priests at Oyster Bay. And there were Father Kelly, and Father Chicada, and Father Dolan, and Father Barry. Those four. Waiting to meet with Monsignor Lefebvre. And afterwards, we found out that on the way from the seminary to Oyster Bay, Monsignor Lefebvre and Father Williamson, and I think Father Denis Roque was with him, they stopped and they spent a certain amount of time, a good length of time, with the society's attorney, Al Skidmore. Evidently talking about this whole situation and how it was going to play out. So uh, we didn't know that at the time. The priests in Oyster Bay did not know that there had been this consultation with the attorney, Mr. Skidmore, uh, until later. <coughs> if they had known this when the meeting took place, uh, I don't know if it would have affected anything or changed anything. But regardless, uh, when Monsieur Lefebvre spoke with them, um, uh, it did not go well. And as I understand it, uh, and again, I wasn't there for that. But I, as I understand it, um, it went so poorly that at one point, Father Chicada even told Monsignor Lefebvre that he had somehow secured the chapel corporations. Um, <coughs> that's my best recollection of Father. Which, uh, when I heard about this, I was quite amazed about it. I had no idea what that meant or how that was done. I certainly had not been informed about it. As it turns out, that couldn't have been the case. That's the way it worked out later. So, anyway, the result of all this was Monsieur Lefebvre told everyone to go. And, uh, take your liberty. Uh, is the French way of saying, get lost. <laughs> so, a nice way of saying go. So, um, but they didn't go. They stayed right in Oyster Bay. And as a matter of fact, I, as far as I knew, was still in residence at the seminary. So the weekend came, and I went on my way to the missions for Sunday masses. I came back, uh, actually by train, uh, and was supposed to be picked up by some of the faithful. They didn't pick me up. No word, they just weren't there. So I called someone, came and got me, took me to the seminary, the door was locked. Uh, and so I, my, my, the keys had all been changed. The locks had all been changed. My keys did not work, I couldn't get in. Um, all of my belongings were in the room at the top of the stairs, but I couldn't get to them. So, uh, at that point, I was informed that the other priests who had been removed from the seminary were living just across the hedgerow in Dr. Kumaraswamy's home. He bought the home to be near the seminary, and little did he think at the time that it would be used as a refuge. But Father Sandberg was there, and a number of other priests were there, and as it turns out that night, I went there, but not for long. Uh, because at uh, some point during the night, lo and behold, one of the seminarians came to get me. I won't mention the name. He came to the house to get me because someone had called to the seminary office uh, for marriage counseling and they wanted to speak with me because I was the one who had been involved with this all along. So, uh, in fact, uh, Father Williamson, who at that time was in charge, who had taken charge, sent the seminary to come and get me. So I went over to the rectory, I went over to the seminary office, and I don't know if to go into all that or not is really important, but I'll try to be brief on that. Um, Bishop Williamson was there. A number of seminarians were there. Jim Hanus was there. He was a very large, very tall individual. Good man. I knew him quite well. And I've been a spiritual director. And, um, but they were all staring at me as though I was public enemy number one and not to be trusted. So I came in. And as I picked up the phone, Bishop Williamson said, uh, how long will you be? And I said, well, I don't know. He said, it depends on what's involved here. 
He says, well, I'm posting these seminarians here to make sure you find your way out. I say, well, I've been letting myself in and out for five years. I think I can find a way out. He said, well, I'm going to leave these two seminarians here to guard the door just to make sure you find your way out. So with that, he retired, and Jim Hanos retired from the office, and I talked to the people for a while, and we finished. And then, I guess I was supposed to walk out the office door to the exterior and go back to the refugium back in the refuge. But I thought, you know, all my belongings are upstairs. This doesn't really make any sense. I haven't even been, been told that I'm not supposed to be here by anybody. Um, and so, I'm just going to go through my room. So I walked out the office door, said goodnight to the two seminarians who were posted there. We looked at each other. <laughs> what did we do now? Look, I walked past them, uh, went up the stairs, and when I got to the open my door and was closing my door, uh, one of them, again a good man, uh, put his hand against the door and said, Father, you can't stay here. I said, well, I won't mention the name. I said, well, you know better. You know this is right. He said, if you close the door, I'll have to uh, call the police. And I said, well, that's probably a good idea. So I called, closed the door. And uh, lo and behold, as soon as I closed the door, I, the phone rang. And it rang, and it rang, and it rang, and no one answered. So I went over and answered. And uh, the person on the other end recognized my voice, and they said, Oh, Father Jack, it's you. But they weren't expecting me to be there. So uh, I said, Well, yes, of course. Uh, what can I do for you? He said, Well, I, I want to talk to Bishop Williamson, Father Williamson. So I put him on hold, and I write Father Williamson, and he picked up, and I said to Father Williamson, I said, Father Williamson, someone's on the line one for you. And he recognized my voice also, and he was not happy. So uh, about 10 minutes later, a note came under my door. Father Williamson pushed it under my door, was rattling it around. And the, the note said, to avoid further unpleasantness, you should leave as soon as possible. Which, um, as far as I'm concerned, was kind of silly, because he could have knocked on the door, and I would have happily opened it. He had nothing to fear from me, and I didn't think I had anything to fear from him. But anyway, so the whole thing was very strange. It was just very peculiar, the way it was all carried out. So anyway, and at that point, I still hadn't been told I'd been expelled. To my knowledge, I hadn't been expelled. Uh, but as time went on, it was clear. Actually, I stayed there for another couple of days and wandered freely around the cemetery. Uh, Mayor Monsieur Lefebvre was there at that time. I even went down to the office and saw them churning out letters and, 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 and a huge mailing that was going out all over the country. And while they're doing all of this work, I pick up a copy of the letter right there in the office with all of us going around and I read the letter. And I realized there are things in here that are simply not true. So I circled it in red and went right into Monsieur Lefebvre's room. And I knocked on the door, and Monsieur Lefebvre opened the door. He didn't look surprised to see me. He invited me in. We sat down. And uh, I had the letter, which was his letter, going out to all the people in the world in the country, tucked in my cassock sleeve. And I said, Monsieur, I think there's been a misunderstanding here. I said, you realize that we do not say that all of these, these popes in Vatican II are not popes. We, we don't say that. He said, well, I don't know. I said, you realize we don't say that, uh, we don't say that all the new sacramental rites are invalid. He said, I know that. And then I pulled the letter up, I shared it to them when I'd circled there, I said, well, Senator Lefebvre, this isn't true. You say here that we believe that all these popes are invalid, and that we believe all these sacramental rites are invalid. And I said, we don't believe that. That's not true. And his answer to me was extremely distressing. Again, my French is terrible. I, I got a tongue tied today, anyway. But his answer was that is a detail. That is a detail. That was not a detail to me. That was wrong. And he certainly saw the disappointment on my face. Like I was really, really taken aback by that. So much so. I had nothing more to say. I didn't even bother saying any more. I, I had more to say, but I just said, there's nothing more to be said about that. That's a detail. So I simply stood up, and I took my leave, and received his blessing, and left. That's the last time I ever saw him. 
But the next morning I was still at the center. And I went back down because I heard all this emotion in the office, and there are the same seminarians still stuffing all these letters. And I couldn't understand why they had been madly stuffing all these envelopes the day before. It never took us two days to get a mailing out to the entire mailing list. So I picked up a copy of that letter and found out it won't see her overnight and changed the letter. He had taken all of the letters that he had written, had them take them all of the envelopes and destroyed them, rewrote the letter, <coughs> and had them go through the whole process again. And he corrected the things that I had mentioned to him. And that made me think, well, the Archbishop is an honest man and he cannot he cannot live even being deceitful about anything that even considers a detail. He just cannot. And the second thing is, I wish I'd stayed and continued explaining to him where the other mistakes were in his letter. Because his letter was still going out with errors in it about more misrepresenting us. But I never got to. Anyway, uh, I left the seminary after that, uh, suddenly, um, and uh, we all wound up in Oyster Bay. We didn't stay at Dr. Kumar Swami's house too long, we wound up in Oyster Bay, uh, which meant basically the priests who were teaching at the seminary, or had been teaching at the seminary, relocated down to Oyster Bay, where Father Kelly, Father Chicago, Father Dolan, Father Barry were still holding forth. And I had actually been down at Oyster Bay for one solid month when I received a note in the mail. <coughs> it was a card, about yay big, like a 4 by 6 index card, and it contained on it a single sentence, a single sentence that said, Dear Father Jenkins, or just Father Jenkins, you were expelled for agreeing with the rest, quote unquote. You were expelled for being with the rest. Now that's the first indication that I had that I had been expelled, except for the changing of the locks. No one had ever said, until that moment, that I was expelled. First I ever saw that. And it was not signed, it was uh, at the end of that statement were the initials RNW, which stands for Williamson. Richard Neville Williams, right? And that was it. That's my formal notice that after all that, I had been expelled. Again, when I first thought this, this is not the way to do things. And so anyway, uh, since then, um, things really haven't gotten that much better, uh, as you know. Um, um, there was a fateful decision we made, a fateful decision that uh, Father, that Monsieur Lefebvre made, and Father Williamson made. Um, we were facing the prospect of just um, basically packing our things and moving out of everywhere. Um, and there was some serious discussion about that. I think some of the priests were of a mind to just do that, and others were of a mind not to do that. And the reason why they were of a mind not to do that was because of this, they were thinking, well, um, we, have, we understand that those who um, thought that we were wrong and uphold Monsignor Lefebvre in this whole situation had been told that the Society of St. Pius X from Europe would not be in a position to send them priests to offer Mass for a couple of years. And so our understanding was that they were being told that we were to leave the chapels, but that they could not send other priests to serve for a long time. And that, at least for me, was a deciding factor. Because we're the ones who convinced the people to make the contributions that they had made. And we made them, we convinced them to make these contributions with the understanding of the solidity, they could count on this, they would have a place practice the faith themselves, their children, their grandchildren, and not only uh, were they going not to be required to accept these changes or else, but um, 
that they wouldn't even have priests come to, to offer Mass or anything else in those chapels for quite some time. And so the uh, discussion finally ended with the priests in general um, saying, we can't just walk away. So it really wasn't a matter of the properties, honestly. Uh, now, what happened after that was lawsuits, you know, lawsuits, legal action. I'd say 90% of the legal action came from Europe. 90% or so of the lawsuits, I believe, came from the SSPX. And uh, there were a couple of legal actions, I know that Fala Chicana started, I think one was in Delaware, I'm not sure where the other one was. Now, if you were to ask me, knowing what I know now, having been through those years of litigation, would I still have been in favor of uh, holding on uh, or and simply not walking away? Uh, I don't know what I'd say, because it was an awful thing, just an awful going through with the litigation. But I know that it was the prospect of walking away from all of these chapels, not just the chapels, but the people, walking away from the congregations and leaving them basically high and dry, that seemed like a, something that was out of the question. Whether we could have found another way, say, well, we'll rent a hall, that's where we all started, and we'll just rent halls in all these places, and you can come and attend Mass in these rented halls again. Uh, I suppose that would have been an option, but it wasn't an option we really considered at the time. At least I didn't. I don't recall it being brought up in our meetings. So, anyway. Um, but you know, the history was a very bloody and very bad history. Okay? And uh, I would say this. I, I would say neither side in this was entirely blameless. It's very hard to get involved in things like that and be entirely blameless. You have to be a saint uh, to go through these processes and not have anything that you regret later. Um, and even saints might make mistakes that they regret later. So uh, I just found the whole experience to be so awful that I, I consider it to be the devil's work, certainly. But the lawsuits would finally resolve in this way. And I think it's important for you to know this again because you will be told that we stole the properties. We didn't steal any properties. That's not true. There are priests in the SSPX who will tell you today that we stole the properties, but they will tell you that because that's what they've been told and they don't know they weren't there. That's what they've been told and they're just repeating these stories. The fact is that there was litigation of these properties. In some cases, the court said, well, let the people decide which way they want to go. That's <laughs> my understanding. In the case of, uh, here, I think, uh, a gentle, very generous gentleman who was uh, largely responsible for the purchase of the church in Sharonville, uh, made it clear that his intention was not to buy the church for any particular interest group, but just to secure the faith and the, the continuation of the, of the Catholic faith there. Um, there was, in Minnesota, there was, um, and in Oyster Bay, I think, I think there were, and also, also in Michigan, and, uh, Redford, Michigan. Um, well, let's see, not Minnesota, no, Redford, Michigan, and, um, and also Oyster Bay. The case was decided this way, and this was, this was settled out of court. Actually, the SSPX agreed that we would pay the priests would somehow, actually what it came down to, was the people on uh, St. Pius X Church in Redford, Michigan, and the people at Oyster Bay Co. would pay the Society of St. Pius X $450,000 for those two properties. And the Society of St. Pius X agreed to that. Actually, they more than recovered whatever monies were spent initially buying them, so the people had to buy them all over again. Uh, the Church of St. Francesus and Martinian in uh, Minneapolis, St. Paul, was forfeit, so that actually was turned over to the size of the, the, the tent. And the congregation with Father Broshka had to go on and had to find another church. They just celebrated their 20th anniversary, St. Anne's. And so, um, as you can see, there was a 
bit of confusion here. There were some churches that actually just simply uh, went to the Society of St. Vice and Tenth, St. Gertrude, uh, went with the priests, our priests. I think there are some important things that came out of this, though. This, this uh, expulsion took place at the end of 1983. So this is the 30th anniversary of that. April was the 30th anniversary of this event. And all that followed from it. One of the first things we did, then, when we were all together at Oyster Bay, was sit down and hammer out a statement of principles, which you can still read today. How many of you have ever read the statement of principles? How many of you are even aware that we hammer out a statement of principles? How many don't even know that we have a statement of principles? This is 1984. I have copies of it. Uh, I guess we have to make copies available in the uh, vestibule. But we hammered out a statement of principles because we all agreed that that was the problem the Society of St. Pius X was having. That they didn't have a clear cut statement of principles to give them as guidelines over their day to day actions and how they judged certain things and how they operated. Um, they didn't have this higher sense of principles enunciated so that people could read them and say, I agree with that, or I don't agree. And so with Archbishop Lefebvre, even during the time of Paul VI, when Paul VI came after John the Twenty-Third, John the Twenty-Third died after the first year of the council, 1962, 63, Paul VI was elected. It was from 1963 to 1978. That's a long time, 15 years. And those who were going to church, the Catholic Church in 1962, and who were still going to church in 1978, found that in those 15 years there was a massive change in the religion such that in 15 years they saw their religion entirely transformed. That they would scarcely see any resemblance from the religion they were practicing in the church could be the same church, 1962 or 63, and what they were practicing in 1970 and 1979. That's, that's the dramatic change. In one reign, all six. But during that reign, Archbishop of Fev, when there was diplomacy offered to him, he accepted diplomacy. When there was war, he would be in a war mode. Depending on the attitude in Rome, Archbishop of would be either in a diplomatic position or in a, in a militaristic uh, position. He was simply responding to it. When John Paul II came in, John Paul II decided to adopt a more diplomatic approach, thinking that maybe he could smooth this over, get the Archbishop and sigh back into the cold again. Didn't work. It almost worked, though. One part of the story that you, many of you know, but not all of you know. For years we were wondering, why was this happening? That the Archbishop would suddenly find it a do-or-die question to impose the John XXIII changes at the expense of not only expelling priests, but having a massive crisis throughout the society of St. Pius X. Because we weren't the only ones <clears throat> who were involved in such a, such a problem. And we found the answer finally within a few years. It became public that Monsignor Lefebvre was actually negotiating with the Vatican. He was working on a protocol, which was a kind of operating agreement with the Vatican, which would allow him and the Society of St. Pius X to have the suspension lifted and to be accepted back into the good graces of Rome. So the Monsignor of the Society of St. Pius X would be accepted as an official function of the of the church, as it was. And uh, Monsignor Lefebvre was very anxious to accomplish that. 
was, again, he was a diplomat, he was concerned about Seoul, he was very concerned about the scandal <coughs> given to Seoul's, uh, and he was concerned if there was any way to heal this rift, that rift, he was duty-bound and conscious to try to pursue it. That's how he felt, I know that's how he felt. And so uh, he did sign the protocol in 1988 with the Vatican. And uh, within a matter of, uh, some say within 24 hours, he recognized that it was not good, it was bad, it was a trap, he said, and he repudiated it, he tore it up. And uh, within the year, he consecrated bishops and was excommunicated uh, formally. Um, even though the new code of canon law says if someone acts in good conscience because he thinks he's doing what he, he's acting out of necessity, he's not subject to censure. Even though the new code of canon law formally says that. And no one ever questioned but that the Archbishop was acting in good conscience because of what he believed was necessity in the churches that saved Christ. They still excellent. And the other bishops he consecrated. And, uh, so we saw how it all played out, um, uh, just for your own information, um, once Monsignor Lefebvre had consecrated the bishops, we sent him a telegram congratulating him on his courage. I was told later by someone at the table uh, with Monsignor Lefebvre that he received many, many telegrams and communications from around the world congratulating him. But allegedly, ours was the only one he read aloud at the table in Akon. He was so pleased to hear from us. And uh, sometime after that, I, I called uh, Father Hervé de la Tour. Father de la Tour had talked with us for one year at Akon, at uh, Richfield. And I have a very high regard for him. He'd been in charge, I think, at St. Mary's also. He went to Australia for a while. Um, but I contacted Father de la Tour. And I asked him to ask Monsignor Lefebvre if he would be with me. And sometime later, Father de la Tour got back to me, and he said he had spoken with Monsignor Lefebvre, and Monsignor Lefebvre said that later on that year, he was going to be in Geneva, and he would be happy to see me there. But he became very ill, and he died. So I never did see him. So it turns out. But uh, in any case, here we are today, and the problem that we have today is we have the second generation of priests, or third generation of priests, the Society of St. and Ten, who are still spouting the old distortions about city vacantism, about stealing properties, and all this, and they actually believe these things. And it's very, very hard to dispel them because they won't even talk about them. They just state them uh, as though they were dogmatic facts. There was no discussion possible. Even were we to tell them point blank that is not our position, they would insist that it must be our position because that's what they've been told by their superiors and highest intent. But you have to remember that none of them was there. None of them was involved firsthand in any of this going on. They're only a very... There's only a handful of the old priests in Science and Vice who are involved in this firsthand. And even they probably uh, don't know, don't necessarily know the whole story. Because they're only talk, we're only actually talking, we only have communication with the pure. So the public accusations, the public uh, recriminations continue. If there has been an outreach, and there has been an outreach, and that the outreach has actually been through, basically, through Father Greenblatt and myself, they're more than happy to meet with priests of the Society of Pius X, take them to lunch, talk to them about things. I won't mention any names unless they get anybody in trouble, but we have uh, met on um, a couple of occasions, each with, well, actually more than a couple of occasions, one priest and a couple of occasions, one of the other priests of the Society. Been visited here by uh, a couple of priests of the Society of Leaders, at our invitation, who came and, as I say, just visited with us. And um, uh, just recently, I was talking to a couple of the priests who were down at Our Lady of the Assumption, and on the occasion of a soccer game, and 
try to make the point of, you know, we really have to talk about these theological questions because somebody can wind up in a theological uh, space or a theological, you know, outer space uh, if they're just kind of left to in a closed cell ruminating about them among themselves. Um, we have to have some various serious discussions about these things and be willing to engage in verbal uh, fisticuffs or martial arts if necessary, but we have to talk about it. Otherwise, we kind of get into this kind of theological ghetto, and that's not helpful. So, uh, trying to open up an interest there and getting together and discussing it. Um, we found a certain openness and only a very few in even discussing matters uh, facing traditional Catholics everywhere. But at least it's a start. Um, personally, I think one can demonstrate to the priests of the Society of St. Pius X, if you have the opportunity, that their position is the worst possible position to hold. Uh, and I would tell them that point by point, because I have, I have to. Priests have been ordained for the last several years. I, when I had the opportunity, I told them, you know, your position is the worst possible position. You accuse us of being sedificatus. You don't even bother to find out if that's true or not, and that's not right. And uh, are you even interested in knowing what our position is? And generally, you will say yes, and so I'll explain it to them. And they, I'm not saying they accepted it, but they realized that that's not necessarily what they've been telling everybody. But then I will tell them, you know, your position, while you're accusing us, your position is the worst possible position to hold. And they're quite taken aback by that. But the fact is, um, it is, right? And, and I explained to them why. I said, look, the dogmatic city of the country is wrong. They have no authority to make judgments like this. They can't tell you whether someone is a pope or not. They can tell you what their opinion is. They can make a logical argument. I've been through this before. But they end. When they come up with a follow a logical argument, all they come to is a logical conclusion. Maybe it's a theological conclusion, but that's all it is. It's their opinion. It doesn't have any dogmatic value. You can't say every Catholic has to has to believe what I believe about this. You could be wrong. I could be wrong. I have my own opinion. I could be wrong on this. Uh, and the most I can accuse somebody who doesn't agree with me of being illogical, but I can't accuse them of not being Catholic. On the question of John Paul II or Francis is famous. I may say they're illogical, but I can't say they're not Catholic. I don't have the authority. I don't have the competence. You know this. But imagine if I were to tell you this. Imagine if I were to get up in the pulpit someday and say to you, Francis I is the Pope. Absolutely the Pope. There is absolutely no doubt that he is the Pope. If you doubt that he is the Pope, do not come to the communion rail. You can't be involved with the Society of St. Pius V. You shouldn't even be coming to this church. Okay, everybody got that? And the second point I want to make is, of course, we don't have to do anything he says. You see, Robin? Yes, he is absolutely the Pope. No, in practice, we don't have to do anything that he says. Do you see a problem with that? When I told one of the priests, you know, if I were really certain that he was the Pope, I would obey everything I could. I'd be looking for ways to obey him. If he said fast tomorrow, I'd be fasting tomorrow. If he said fast yesterday, I'd fast yesterday. <coughs> He said, this is the way it is. I believe the Pope, the successor of St. Peter, the uh, vicar of Christ on earth, if he gave a legitimate command, a command that did not conflict with Catholic teaching, uh, even if I had doubts or wasn't certain, I would, I would definitely follow his command. I would feel obliged in conscience under pain of sin to, to obey. But that's not the society of St. Pius X's position. You, you, in, you, you insist to everyone that he really is the Pope and he has the authority of the Pope. Necessarily. But in practice, you totally ignore whatever he says. Except to criticize him. You will not feel yourself a bond to obey, obey anything he says. Did you see a problem with that? Actually, some of the priests did see a problem with that. 
and admitted to me there is an inconsistency in the society's position. That is the most monstrous position possible. There's nothing worse than you could than you, than my mind, anyway. No worse position that a Catholic would take in that. That, to me, is a schismatic mentality. Yes, he's the Pope, and no, he cannot tell us what to do. In anything. <laughs> Isn't that the very definition of schism? So, so, trying to get this message across to them, while they're busy hollering, say to be kind of, say to be kind of, say to be kind of, cooties, say to be kind of, are you trying to get past them and have, enable them to understand that they, they basically painted themselves into a corner where they're in a, an untenable position for a cat? It's very difficult to get that message across to them. That, we keep trying anyway. And, but this is the situation we're, we're facing right now. We have this continuing situation. Uh, where do I, what do I hope for? I hope that eventually we may be able to get somebody to answer the phone and listen so that we can actually begin to have some serious discussion about these serious issues and um, try to resolve them as well as we can. And I think one of the first things we need to resolve is where are we, what questions are we competent to answer, and what questions are we not competent to answer? And then address the, the questions that we have a certain competency to answer. The Catholicity or non-Catholicity of the New Mass. Somebody was asking recently um, how we can say that the New Mass is absolutely wrong, no doubt about it, but we can't say for sure dogmatically that the praxis, let's say, is not the Pope. How do you explain that? And, and that's a very good question, frankly, but I think there's a good answer to that. And that is, the Church has condemned the, the things that are actually in the New Mass. The Church has formally condemned, dogmatically condemned, notably at the Council of Trent, the changes that have been made, made in the Mass the changes to the traditional Mass, what has been deleted, and the, the, the very substance of the new Mass, it has already been condemned by the Church, formally condemned. Things that uh, Francis have, has done and said, have they been condemned? Uh, actually, yes, they have been. Implicitly, he is going against things. He's not coming up and directly saying, the Church taught this, but, that's, but I'm saying exactly the opposite. He's never come out and said exactly that way. Is he contradicting church teaching? Yes, he is. But, as Archbishop Lefebvre told me once, actually, implicitly he is, explicitly he's not coming out and saying, I reject Catholic church teaching on that subject, instead, this is my teaching. Exactly the opposite. He's never come out and said that. And then, even, but there's the other question, too. Even in I'm implicitly denying Catholic teaching, principles of moral theology, and so on. Even if one sees that he's doing that, the consequences of him doing that are not as clear as you might think. There are volumes and volumes written on the office of the papacy, by theologians, fathers of the church, doctors of the church. Volumes and volumes written about these things, giving varied opinions about what would happen if a pope would fall into heresy. They generally agree a pope could fall into heresy, he could lose the faith, in which case it would be as though he had died, as far as the church is concerned. But how one responds to that, how one reacts to it, Sure, there are very powerful voices, such as that of St. Robert Bellarmine, who says that if a pope would say something that was damaging to the church, damaging to souls, that it would be incumbent upon the Catholic person to refuse to obey him and to impede the execution of his command. In other words, to try to make sure that others don't obey him either. In other words, they can formally oppose him with all their might 
If he does something that would just damage him from the church or damage him to souls. But the question, if a pope were to become a formal heretic, theologians would say, by that very fact, he would lose his office. Others, like Cajetan, said that he would have to be deposed by the bishops or by the cardinals. Well, they've already stacked the deck there. And so the procedures to follow, to come to the conclusion, which is almost at the level of a dogmatic fact, as I say, that, that Francis is not the Pope, that is not so easily reached. That's much more obscure. Are we free to interpret things a certain way? We are. Are we free to reach our own conclusion? We are. Are we free to make our own conclusions dogmas? We are not. When it comes to the new Mass, the Church has formally condemned these things in the past. If you, we, can, we can talk about what those things are at some point, and look at what the, the condemnations from, from Trent of exactly what the new Mass is, exactly what the new Mass does. Um, but on this other question, it's not so clear cut that we can be so certain that someone actually cannot be the Pope. And I'm saying this as someone who is very convinced <laughs> that Francis is not the Pope. I'm personally convinced. I'll be very honest. I've never made a, uh, made, made bones about it. But that and a dollar and a half might get you a cup of coffee. Maybe. It doesn't mean not to a single thing. Because I still pray for him that if he doesn't have the faith, God will give him the faith. And I also pray that if God gives him the faith, God will also give him the grace to have such a great devotion to the faith that he will boldly proclaim the faith even unto martyrdom. That's what I'm praying for. But there are so many souls that depend upon. They depend upon his leadership. Um, so as I say, uh, to sum things up on this whole issue, whatever my personal opinion is, it could change tomorrow and then change again the day after that. Because it's an opinion, and I know I could be wrong. As convinced as I may personally be, logically, that someone is or is not the Pope, one thing I know for a fact, it always comes down to this again, I know I'm not the Pope. I know that for a fact. I have no doubt about that. You realize that too, I'm sure. And so I'm not going to pretend to be the Pope. Okay. Um, but in any case, uh, this seems to have been the, become the issue the Society of St. Pius X has latched on because it's the one that really seemed to work. And it's unfortunate. Uh, it makes it very, very difficult to actually address the serious issues that confront all traditional Catholics. But I believe that this is what, exactly what Satan does. He confuses the issue and tries to divide. We know that. We shouldn't be surprised. And if I may, if I may, oh dear, I'm sorry. Oh my goodness, is this possible? Oh no, no, I'm sorry. Okay, I didn't set my watch back an hour, so. <laughs> <laughs> it's getting late enough, though. <laughs> uh, allow me to just uh, make one more point, though. There are people who are very dismayed or even discouraged Especially young people get scandalized among the divisions, about the divisions among the traditional Catholics. First of all, I would say to them, you'd have to expect that there's no other way. The formal cause of unity in any society, in the church as a society, is authority. And when the authority falters, you're going to have this happen. There's going to be <coughs> fractionalization and factionalization. It's a necessary consequence. If we're talking about the uh, problems at the very top, with the authority that is supposed to provide for the unity of the church, faltering, that voice being stilled, even being compromised or worse, of course you're going to have the consequences. It can't be otherwise. If it were otherwise, there'd be something wrong. So, um, 
The second point I would make to them, nonetheless, even among traditional Catholics, as confused as they may be, and as very divided as they are on certain practical points, as I told you before, they are all united in the essential things, <coughs> really. Um, we all believe everything in the Catechism. We have the same faith. We all believe everything. Uh, we all follow the same worship, essentially. Um, and um, we all agree that the church is in a state of crisis. Uh, we all believe that the church, the crisis is caused by modernism. And we all believe that the solution to the crisis, the only way to get, get through it, is by holding fast to Catholic tradition. We all agree on that. But the disagreements all come in on the matter of how do you do that? How do you remain faithful to Catholic tradition? That's where the breakdown comes. That's where you need the day-to-day -day living voice of the church, the magisterium, the voice of jurisdiction with authority from the apostles who were told by Christ, going therefore and preach the gospel to all nations. That's where you need that authority. When it's where the application comes to actually living the faith, to be faithful to Catholic tradition which is above all the authority of all the popes. How do you exactly do that? And there are those who are willing to cut corners and do things that the church has always condemned. There are those who are not going to cut those corners. This gives rise to divisions right away. But there is more unity of faith and of worship, and even of government, even of government, among the divided traditional Catholics than there is in the Novus Ordo. In the Novus Ordo, you don't see the unity of faith in those people. They're all over the map. From priest to priest, from bishop to bishop, there's no unity of faith there. Unity of worship? Forget it. There's no unity of worship there. In practice, even in principle. As soon as they accept the, 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 uh, the vernacular, there's no unity of worship there. Hundreds of different languages, translations, trying to get them all to say and mean the same thing. There's, there's no unity there. And government, that is, that is even the worst. As far as government, as far as the Catholic people following the disciplinary requirements and moral law of the church, abortion, birth control, woman priests, all the rest. You don't need the surveys to tell you. They're not there. Obama issues this Obamacare command that we all pay for abortion ser reproductive services, for our insurance policies, for our employees, right? Catholic hospitals, Catholic colleges, and so on. 53% of the Catholic people in the United States of America are surveyed to support that measure in Obamacare. They, a few of the bishops say, we've got to stop this. The support isn't there. And the Catholic people, the support is not there. And then they say, well, how can this be? How can this be? It's hard to believe they're honest and they say that it's so so anyway, uh, there is, even with the divisions among the tra traditional Catholic groups, there is more unity among them, with the, even with the things that divide them, in matters of faith, matters of worship, and even in matters of discipline and moral, 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 moral principles. The actual practice of the Catholic life, than there is among the, in the Novus Ordo. So I just want our young people to get their message too, that uh, they shouldn't be scandalized when the shepherd is struck and the sheep are scattered, you know, shouldn't be scandalized by that. They shouldn't be scandalized when Peter, one minute, says, Thou art the Christ and the Son of the living God, and the next minute is arguing with Jesus Christ that he will never be crucified. This is out of the question. And our Lord calls him Satan. He tells him he says, it's a scandal. We want our young people to have a stronger faith and a better understanding of our faith than that. 
So anyway. Well, with that, and I'm sorry, it's already 11 o'clock at night. If anybody needs to run out the door, I certainly understand it very well. I'll be right behind you, in front of you. If anybody has any questions or observations, you are more than welcome to make them. I personally would welcome your, your thoughts on all this. If you have any sound for us. Anybody? I have a question. In the canon of the Mass, I don't include Pope Francis. Okay. Is that a question? No, that's not a question. <laughs> uh, the reason I say it, Alyssa, I wasn't asking for questions because if you get questions, I start answering. We'll be here forever. No, no, that's so. What I really want is just your comments. Yeah, go ahead. I just wanted to know, and I, ho I hope I'm doing right, but I don't feel comfortable saying his name. In that. Okay. So I just go from servants to bishops. I, I, By omitting his name, are you saying that as far as you're concerned, he's not the Pope? That's the end of the question. Yes. You are saying that. Okay. I really feel strong. And you certainly have every right to. I've done that. Because he's given you a reason to do so. I even did that with John Paul. Pope Paul. When they John give Paul. scandal as they have, you are justified in yeah. I felt kind of funny no, when, no. at first when I started that, but I thought, no, I'm going to stick to my guts. Okay. No. That, that's all I had to say. Okay, we are very candid about that. Uh, I'm sure there are those who agree with you. Any other comments? Okay, well, thank you very much. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Ghost, and that. Glory be to the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Ghost, as it was in the beginning, is now and ever shall be, world without end. Amen. Eternal rest grant unto them, O Lord. Let perpetual light shine upon them, and they rest in peace. Amen. May their souls and the souls of all people be parted for the mercy of God rest in peace. Amen. If I can, I ask you to join me on memorari for all of those whose names were mentioned here tonight. Remember, O most gracious Virgin Mary, that never was it known that anyone who fled to thy protection, implored thy help, and sought thy intercession, was left in aid. Inspired by this confidence, I fly unto thee, O Virgin of Virgins, my mother. To thee do I come, before thee I stand, simple and sorrow. O Mother of the Word incarnate, despise not my petitions, but in thy mercy hear and answer me. Amen. O Mary, refuge of sinners, pray for us. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Ghost. Amen.